Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Black Tower Podcast, a Wheel of Time podcast. I am Andrew, and as always, today we're going to be talking about Robert Jordan's The Wheel of Time. With me today, I have uh, two people that, if you, especially if you're in the Discord, you will find familiar. It's JD and Thorne, two of our lovely listeners who have thrown their names into the mix to possibly be our new co-host here on the podcast. Why don't you guys go ahead and say hi? Okay, I'm Thorne Cordenabier. Uh I am basically part of the fandom, and I do a little bit of art. That's pretty much all for me. <laughs> and I'm Jay. I'm on the Discord. I'm just part of the fandom. Not much there. All right. So uh, to remind our listeners, uh, it is you guys, the listeners, that will be voting on which two potential co-hosts get an ongoing spot here at the Black Tower Podcast. So make sure you guys pay close attention, but even more so, of course, enjoy the episode. And the coming, the next, so after this episode, the next two episodes will feature, uh, each one will feature two more, I guess, candidates. So, you know, wait for that last one to come out, then we'll put out, you know, after a reasonable amount of time for the last one to be listened to. After there's ample time to listen to that, we'll put out a poll or, or something on like Twitter and Discord and all that and you know, let the, the listeners decide on, you know, who else they want to listen to besides my voice, which I get tired of listening to all the time. So mm-hmm. it'll be nice to have two new voices on the podcast. But uh, JD, you want to do that a uh, spoiler warning for us? Certainly. This podcast includes spoilers from War- Robert Jordan's The Wheel of Time up to and including The Dragon Reborn, which is the third book. If you're not made it this far in the series... Please stop listening now if you don't want to be, wish to be spoiled. If you have, good for you. As you guys can tell by the title of the episode and kind of what we said already, uh, this is our, our book review for the, the third book of the series, The Dragon Reborn, um, which you'll often see abbreviated as uh, TDR. It is, of course, the third book of the Wheel of Time series and was published by Tor Books and released on September 15th of 1991, and is about 699 pages long. This book is older than I am. Yeah, I was about to say, should I feel bad? <laughs> this book's more than a year older than me. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, I think it's a little uh, over two years on me. I, I a think un- no, a little under two. I think I'm about the same. <laughs> oh wow, I'm the oldest one. Okay. I mean, I, w- I was born mid 93, so. Yeah. I'm older than you then. I was born in February of 93. <laughs> yeah, I am the oldest. Because it's literally a year and 10, 12 days older. Oh, okay. <laughs> Something we've we've done with some of the last episodes that I really liked is the the POV breakdown, of course. That's, you know, the the point of views from the chapters. Um just to kind of give you an idea uh, numerically the spread of POV that is used or uh, provided in in the in the book. Um, so Egwene uh, has 33.16 percent uh, of the POV chapters. Perrin has 31.40 percent. Matt has 26.38 percent, and then uh, drastically. Uh, smaller. Rand only has 2.4%. Uh, Edron now has 2.27%. Suwon Sanchi has 0.86%. Uh, Jaitum Keridan has 0.5%. And Varen has 0.09%. So just to give you an idea of how much of the book focuses on which characters. Um, so obviously Egwene and Perrin and Matt uh, dramatically being the three main characters that uh, have POV episodes, uh, episodes, chapters. There's not much of Rand in this at all. I find that funny because it's named after him. Right? <laughs> yeah. The, the one character who you would think would be the main character for this is just not. <laughs> no. Yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of cool too, though. I mean, much in the same way that people are kind of thinking... Uh, the way the show is going to go, they're going to try to hide who the Dragon Reborn is for those that haven't read the series. It's almost like with the amount of, I guess, face time that Rand gets in the book, that, you know, Robert Jordan, I, I can't say he tried to do the same thing, but 
kind of adds, a, I guess, like a little bit of an air of mystery of, you know, where's Rand and what's Rand doing and what's he going to do in this book? And uh, you kind of find out suddenly with him. Yeah, well, it's, he's already been, uh, by this book, he's already been declared the Dragon Reborn, but he hasn't really shown any of the full signs yet. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure like Moraine and, and Suwon, I like they've obviously looked at him and said like you are the dragon reborn and um by the end of this book we finally see Rand actually accept that title uh begrudgingly of course but he does well once you kind of pull Kalandor out of the storm stone there's not much option there <laughs> one of you guys want to want to start off this just kind of a uh, overview of the book Trying to, trying to a new way instead of going chapter by chapter it's kind of got some overall uh, summarization going on here uh yeah from mountains of mist to tear we open randall thor in his mountain hideaway having declared himself dragon reborn at the end of the last book and follow he secretly leaves the shinaran camp in the mountains of mist to go to tear prove himself the dragon reborn after many arguments and quarrels with members of the camp such as moraine said i along the way he is hunted by dark hounds dark friends and the like. Men leaves the camp by order of Moraine to report to the Amarillin. On what has transpired, Moraine, Lan, Loyal, Perrin chase after Ran. Along the way, they encounter a hunter of the horn, Fael Bashir, uh, battle dark, dark hounds, and discover that the forsaken Samael rules in Ilion. Yeah, so in the beginning, we have that, um, that really interesting uh, battle I've uh, seen where the Trollocs, you know, they're kind of, the way I think they describe it is they're kind of camping in like a bit of a crater. And uh, 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 this army of Trollocs um, descends on the camp. And thanks to the wards that uh, Moraine has set, they set off like uh, this audible alarm. Uh, and this battle ensues. Rand was not able to help. He yeah. wasn't able to control Sidene, so he ended up just burning some trees. He spent a lot of time throwing temper tantrums. He was very upset yeah. about that. But kind of around this this whole episode, there's you know Rand's having one of his one of his temper tantrums or or whatever you want to call it, and winds up like shaking the in, the ground around the entire you know camp that is. You know, they're following him or supporting him. Matt's on his way currently to Tarvalin to be healed from the uh, Shadar Logoth blade. So he's not with them in the little hidey hole or or anything. So, it, so then it was Perrin that like, was you know pretty upset with Rand and worried, and because he's dealing with that, and at the same time he's he's trying to still fully understand his his wolf brother status. And I think, you know, Min tells him about vision of uh, that, that girl, I guess, that came to, didn't she come to just give a message to Moraine? Her name was Leah. And um, this is actually a very interesting point. It's a bit of a spoiler because it's not discussed that much, but this is the first real look we get at the um, White Tower's information system. Because there's this, like, oh, this yeah, long true. line of women coming from all over the place. And they talk about uh, merchants' wives, merchants, um, noble women, tinkers, everybody from every class and nationality are coming to see Moraine. And also speaking of the wolves, uh, that, that kind of brings up the topic of the dreams because at this point Perrin is having dreams and the wolves are even trying to talk to him within his dreams. So uh, there's this theory about Matt's luck being that he actually drank the wine that's offered to the boys in the dreams. And I'm kind of into that theory because the other boys have protection. Uh, Rand has a little bit of uh, protection from Sidene because Moraine mentions earlier in the series that uh, – Channelers get a small amount of protection from being able to channel with their dreams. Uh, and Perrin, every time that uh, Lanfear tries to get him to drink the drink the wine, gets distracted by the wolves. 
so the wolves are already protecting him but matt doesn't have any kind of protection like that also random wine glass on a table Go, uh, going ahead and drinking it does sound like a matt thing to do <laughs> that's a very matt thing to do <laughs> well known for you know throughout the series maybe not on the face at face value making the absolute best judgment call and taking the i guess best course of action but somehow normally it works out for him and um, assuming the fan theory is correct which I, I like it too i think it's a good theory and um, i i definitely believe it it's like another example of that you know i'm not doing something that normally isn't the best idea and it winds up working out for him I'm kind of, I kind of enjoy that they kind of leave that in the dark for us to speculate because his luck has to come from somewhere and you can assume it's just because he's Taviran, but there's also this wine thing that keeps popping up and that we never know what happens with Matt in his dreams. Yeah, because, I mean, obviously they, they do a good job of showing us from Rand's point of view. And parents. And, and yeah, and of course parents, but... From what I'm, my recollection, other than Matt saying, yeah, I've had the same dream, we don't hear or get to read or see, get much insight into Matt's experience dreaming of Ozma, <clears throat> which I always found interesting, uh, kind of, you know, along the same lines of, well, I, I don't want to spoil that because that hasn't happened yet. That's next book. But uh, a, a certain thing that Rand, Matt, and Moraine all do at the same time and we only get to actually see one of what happens with one of them. So it's it's kind of a bit of an ongoing theme of several people being involved in the same situation, but us getting partial information from one, little to no information on the other, and full information from from one individual. Which is kind of nice. I mean, it, it leaves that air of mystique. Yes, I love that little bit of mystery that we have because yeah. it lets us as readers think for ourselves. And I believe this was described as the um, the unreliable narrator because it's, it's strictly only told from one person's point of view, like one person at a time. So you have all these uh, concurrent events, but we can only see it from one person. Yeah, I mean, there's there's no like, um, what is it? Not omniscience. Yeah, omniscience. Uh, third yeah, person you're omniscient. right. Oh, yeah. I mean, like it's where it's not like the narrator's everywhere and knows everything, which is which is I mean I think that's always been a really cool element of certain stories, especially this one. Yes, I love the point of view in Wheel of Time. That was one of the things that kept me coming back to it because it makes you care for the characters because you during that time that you're in their point of view, you are that character in a sense. Um, something else I want to point out with the dreams is Matt doesn't get a whole lot of like character development in his dreams. A parent has to deal with the wolves in the wolf dream, and Rand could take more um, agency in his dreams because he can channel and he can defend himself. Matt just kind of stuck out there on a limb and is really re relying on how Matt is right now to save himself. Yes, so, I mean agreed. that could be part of the reason why we don't see really see his dreams is because his character development lies elsewhere. Yeah, for sure. Um, something else I wanted to point out that we, we found out from this kind of first chunk of The Dragon Reborn is we, we've seen, uh, especially in, in the previous two books, this element of, you know, you can deny your destiny or your fate or whatever, but it doesn't really matter, you know, whether you like it or not. When Ran meets the, the Amerlin seat uh, still in the Shanir and Borderlands, you know, and she's like, well, whether you, whether you like it or not, whether you admit it or not, you know, you're, you are who you are. You're going to channel whether you want to or not. It's kind of how things go. We kind of see a, a bit of that same kind of inevitability uh, of circumstance uh, early on in this book series. I mean, in this book and the dragon reborn, because, you know, obviously men tells Perrin, uh, the visitor she has of, of Leah dead and parents like oh i'm gonna do everything i can to stop it and men's like you can try but everything i see always comes true and sure enough uh, it does despite par despite parents best efforts 
Yeah, and in the end, what happens is that the Merdral goes to attack Perrin, and Leah actually throws herself at the Merdral, and that's when the Merdral just casually backhands her and kills her with the sword. Yeah, I mean, and that just kind of... We, we see frequent examples of that throughout the entire series. It's kind of a, an overarching theme, is that, <clears throat> you know, you can you can try to resist the pattern and, and what the, the pattern pulls you to do and needs you to do and inevitably makes you do. Um, I think it's even described, uh, if not now, later on in this series, that you can resist it for a time, but the harder you resist, the, the more forcibly the pattern is going to snap you back on whatever course it wants you to be on. Especially for um, Tiberian. While we're on the topic of men's visions, yeah. I think it'd be a good transition to that second part of that chunk where they actually uh, set off because uh, men does tell a parent about her vision of him with the Aiel in a cage, the wolf at his feet, the falcon and hawk fighting over him. I think it was perched on his shoulders. Or as she said, they look like they were fighting. Yeah. Oh, okay, I don't remember that part. Yeah, yeah. I think she says they at least look like they don't like each other. When they set out and they make it to that one river town where they get on the boats, I totally don't remember the name of that. Uh, I think it was uh, Jahar. Was, was that Jahar or was Jahar the village with all the marriages? Jahar was the village with all the marriages, and that's where the wolf brother was that, that gets parent thinking that he's destined to... Yeah. Become an animal, basically. So on that is, it was like three Aiel versus sixteen Wetlanders, and it wasn't even a fair fight. Oh, I think that's. They managed to capture one, kill one, and one managed to mm -hmm. get away. I love Gaul. <laughs> I mean, who can who can't love Gaul? Now that's uh, another thing on not escaping your destiny because Perrin could very well have left him in that cage. He was so held mm -hmm. on not being a hero. He was still on this. Well, I'm just a blacksmith. I don't want to be Taviran or any of this stuff. But instead of leaving uh, Gaul in the cage, he lets him out and they proceed to do violence to white cloaks. The white cloaks kind of get to deserve it, though. Oh yeah, they, well they always That's neither here nor there. They're assholes, but yeah. But before that, while they're still in in Jara, um, remember is whenever Perrin uh, and Moraine are are head are led by Simeon to uh, and they encounter Noam, the someone that's been kind of given, I guess, the same gift or talent than that Perrin has, but has gone off the deep end with it and has been completely absorbed by the bond to the wolves and has, has basically just gone feral as a person. Because Moraine tries to heal him, uh, but, you know, can't do it and says there's nothing human left in him now. Perrin is able to recall men's viewing about the, the Iel men trapped in a cage. That happens in chapter 33 uh, within the Weave. And they ride into a, the town of Remen, R-E-M-E-N. And Perrin smells the same bad scent that he smelt uh, or smelled in Jara. And that's when he sees the uh, the I.L. men in the cage. Because you got that, uh, what is it, Lord Orban and Lord Gon, who are two other uh, hunters of the horn. And they're bragging about how they defeated 20 I.L., and <laughs> like land is like you're full of shit and like there's no way i love land <laughs> oh yeah she's just like yeah <laughs> he does that with so many people like he just looks at him like you are full of so much shit and like i i don't think that land could defeat 20 aiel like there's no way these prissy little hunters for the horn are gonna be able to defeat defeat probably even one Honestly, I'm going to be completely honest with you. I don't think they're there for the most of the action. I'm pretty sure they hurt themselves on their horses, like falling off as soon as the fight started. Yeah, I think they said something like that. I, I think Gaul says something like that, and Gaul does not strike me as a liar. I mean, because, well, there's that, that concept of that we find out later of Gia Toe, 
uh, among the IL that there's there's no toe incurred by letting someone believe a lie, but there's definitely toe incurred by telling yeah. a lie. Yes. Uh, the very next chapter is whenever you know Gaul is is talking to Perrin, and it says that it was only him and his friend um, Serene that were attacked by Orban, and that Serene was killed. You know, obviously not before doing uh, his fair share of damage. And then that's whenever Gaul runs off into the night. Uh, and for the second time, it's expressly mentioned that Perrin notices a specific female watching him. And then Lan walks up in typical Lan fashion. He's like, yo, bro, we got to get the fuck out of here. It's our girl, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, a, that's another consistent theme is there's always like, hey, there's someone staring at us and watching us. And it's like, you don't say. <laughs> like, after after it happens so many times by, like, the fourth or fifth book, you just, whenever it happens, you're just like, oh, look, here's somebody that's important. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, like, going through a chapter, let's spot some, some very important foreshadowing. Oh, hey, somebody's watching from the shadows. That's not obvious at all. Yeah, which I think is something that's like relatable for for a lot of readers because who can say that they've never had a, a moment where they felt they were just being watched from the darkness? I mean, imagine like remember being a kid and like you don't want to go through the dark hallway because you feel like there's something there. I still do that as an yeah. adult. I, I do too sometimes. Especially at my parents' house, I do. I don't. I don't like the hallway in my parents' house, but I don't have halls in my house, which is absolutely fantastic for me. Bayel doing the most teenage thing ever with her name. So her real name is Zareen. I love Bayel. <laughs> which is supposed to be like beautiful princess or something like that. <laughs> she changes it to Mandar when she takes her oath as Hunter of the Horn, which is all well and good. In the old lady, in the old tongue, it means blade. Which sounds like something any teenager would do when they got a chance to make up a name. But it's Lance Horse's name. Yes. <laughs> so the next important piece of foreshadowing there, she changes her name to Fael, which is Falcon. Thus going back to the vision. I mean, that entire chapter, uh, 35, where we finally actually meet the girl that has been staring at Perrin all along. Um, I mean, the chapter is called The Falcon. Um, so he, he very quickly goes from laughing about her name as Mandarb to hearing her change her name, then it means Falcon, and uh, figuratively shitting his pants because he's like, okay, th this isn't funny anymore. <laughs> Regretting his life choices. <laughs> I am regret. <laughs> And that's one of those things, like, at the same time that Robert Jordan was very subtle about some things, and, like, he would he would point something out in the beginning, and then he would mention it again until way later, this thing he basically shoved into your face. And I, I kind of love, <clears throat> I mean, we've talked about a lot of the key points from the, from the next kind of block of, of overview, but I love how through this entire block of getting into this kind of second summarized section is the very sporadic moments that we get with Rand. And it kind of makes you feel a little bit more of a kinship with, uh, with Moraine and Perrin and Lan. Um, Cause they're only, you know, picking up little bits and pieces of what's going on with Rand. And that's all we get too. Um, Cause after he leaves their camp uh, in chapter nine, Wolf dreams, uh, we get to see a very, very small portion of Rand, and that's when you know the when we see Rand destroy a dark hound with Balefire, and <clears throat> noting that you know it was not the first, uh, and he's ta and he's kind of thinking about how holding Sidine makes him feel sick, uh, and he wishes that uh, Moraine or Nynaeve could heal him, but he's just focused on now making it to tear where he says he's going to end it all one way or the other. Um, and he's kind of getting into that, like, I'm no easy prey now kind of thing, you know, where uh, I know I, as a reader was looking at him like, all right, uh, dude's already going crazy. And he literally just started. I mean, yeah. there's so much teenage angst, so much angst in the dragon reborn in between Rand and Fayo. That it's, it's it's almost unbearable. Okay, it's like being at my at a My Chemical Romance concert. 
Don't call me out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I keep finding stuff from high school, and, and like honestly, I'm feeling really <laughs> tired right now. <laughs> yeah, listen to them in high school too. <laughs> But like the next little tidbit we get from Rand in chapter 32, when it's after um, Matt and Tom have left uh, Tarvalon, um, leaving from the South Harbor on a, on a ship, boat, watercraft, the the Grey Gull, um, they just kind of jump onto it, uh, which is standard for Matt and Tom now. Um, and we get like this little peek again into what Rand's doing and he's playing a flute to keep himself awake because he can't stand his dreams because um, in his dreams he sees Egwene and Tam, his mother uh, Matt and Perrin and they all try to kill him and they turn out to all be shadow spawn in disguise but for some reason he doesn't quite know why uh, men being one of those that tries to kill him hurts the most even though he feels he can trust her above all others. Foreshadowing. Oh, yeah, I know, right? Hmm, I wonder why. <laughs> then he, you know, has the dreams of Egwene and Nynaeve and Elaine being trapped. Um, but he worries the most about Elaine. Uh, and he takes in dreams of Selene and, uh, and Glory. But now she's telling him to take Kalendor. So much foreshadowing. Such little <laughs> section of the book about Rand. But it it it's so it's it's almost more foreshadowing than like the rest of the chapters, uh, in my opinion. Yeah, Fran does not get a whole lot, and when he does, it's really just set up for later on. Yeah, I mean, because when he dreams about Egwene, um, it was it was actually Egwene. You know, he's had all these dreams where everybody disguises and tries to kill him. Uh, and, but that's actually oh, Egwene's that's first trip right. in, yeah, into Teleron Riod. Um, and he tries to kill her. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he tries to kill her because he thinks that she must be one of the one of his dreams. Yeah, like I, I feel like a second later, like a second sooner for Ran firing at her. I think mm-hmm. this would be the proper term, or a second later for Egwene moving. Like this series would have been over. Gone. As, oh yeah! As soon as he found out, he actually killed her. Like he would have the whole thing would killed himself. We might be looking at another dragon mount. Actually, He'd probably just go crazy right then and there. Like they may have already realized that they don't love each other that way anymore, but he still cares about her. He still loves her, like maybe a sister or something. She's the one person that he can, or the one woman that he can be totally honest with at this point. Well, and there's also a big difference between killing nameless Shanshan soldiers and supposed dark friends and somebody you actually know. Yes, especially somebody you grew up with. I mean, yeah, because, you know, there's a section where, you know, Perrin is having what he calls the wolf dream, which is the world of dreams for, (laughs) for the wolves and the wolf brothers that he it's, doesn't notice for quite a while. It's the exact same world, but yeah. they call it different things. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's, I think that's a good um, allusion to how so many different people can experience the exact same thing, but by, <clears throat> by their socialization, what they're exposed to and what they, what they know from life changes what they think it is. You know, parent, it's always associated with Hopper and, and the wolves in it and he can run and jump and, and kind of fly along with Hopper and everything. So it's like, ah, oh, it's just a wolf dream. I'm just dreaming about wolves. Uh, and then there's actually on um, this one, <clears throat> cause Rand is in the world of dreams again, of course. Um, and Perrin finds him and Rand turns and fires at him, sends fire at Perrin and Perrin actually wakes up with a burn on his chest. Um, and it's in the same chapter. It's uh, chapter 36, Daughter of the Night, um, where <laughs> Perrin asks Moraine, you know, about the name Zareen. And she tells him it's a Saldean name suited for a heartbreaker of great beauty. And then, of course, you know, he goes back up on deck because they're on a ship, too. And uh, Land is, you know, as always, tending to the horse and being ever watchful. And Fail is doing her crip- or her typical angsty teen thing where she's just staring at him 
and then it switches back to that that little small section and to me this is one of the more memorable sections i guess uh, of the of the book is Rand wakes up and thinking that Perrin was real and that he almost actually killed him, which is not wrong. And we find out that he's in the hills of Mirandi, uh, or Mirandi, close to the Manetheran draw, drill. Um, and then uh, there's a female merchant and her guard that approach, and they say they're on their way to Remen, and Rand attacks and kills them all with a sword made of flame. That flaming sword. Afterward, there's 11 men when he only counted 10 beforehand. Uh, and he notices that he still feels that pull to Tyr, which we know was Kalindor, uh, basically calling to him. Uh, yeah. Aren't to Tarvalon. Okay. Uh, from Tarvalon to Tyr. Uh, this is more of a Matt section. Uh, Matt is taken to Tarvalon by Varen, Nynaeve, Egwene, and Elaine, and Huron. They... They skirmish with the Children of the Light before heading to uh, Tarvalin. Uh, immediately after they arrive in Tarvalin, Huron leaves so he can report to King Isar in Shinar. Uh, the Amarlin Omer- seat, Swan Sanche, sets Nynaeve and Egwene to the task of hunting down the Black Aja. Egwene and Nynaeve tell Elaine of their mission uh, because they're not going to keep secrets from Elaine. And she agrees to help them, and they end up traveling to Tyr. In the White Tower, through the use of a saw angriel by the Aes Sedai, Matt is permanently healed of the corruptive influence of the Ruby Dagger from Sh- Shadar Logoth. Once he's healed, well, not totally healed, he's still, like, pretty weak, he ends up defeating both Galad Damadred and Gawain Trakand at the same time using a quarterstaff against their swords. Uh, his improbable victory wins him enough money to gamble with and escape Tarvalin. I believe he jumps on a ship yeah. that we were talking about a second ago. Yeah, the the gray goal that he jumps on with uh, Tom. He's just like, I'm outie. <laughs> he kept saying the first ship, and that was the first ship, and it was already leaving. So they made a leap yeah. of faith, and they made it. And El- Elaine entrusts Matt with a letter to her mother, Queen Morgays, uh, explaining that she'll be leaving the White Tower for some time. I know this is so. Like he he gets the money from winning the wager, um, and then we got a little bit about Elaine talking because uh, Matt tells Elaine that he's leaving as soon as he can. She's like, "Well, since you're gonna leave, can you take this letter?" And then as Matt's roaming around, that's whenever he finally comes across Tom. Yeah, he's in an inn. They escape Tarvalin together and travel to Andor, where Matt delivers the letter. But at the same time, while sneaking about like Matt does, he learns that uh, Lord Gabriel, who is Queen Morghese's lover, has a plan to murder Elaine. Uh, Of course, Matt acts like he's not a hero, but Matt likes to do the right thing all the time. like. He he's very I, I would call him a neutral good or chaotic good would maybe be good for him. He does the right thing, but he complains about it the entire time. Yes, he, he will do it. And it, you can't make him not do it. But he he's going to pretend like he doesn't want to do it. <laughs> but he ends up following the women to tear. Yeah, he's like the unwitting, unwilling nobleman, at least in action. Yeah. So I actually have a couple notes on this. Oh, I think I said something on one of my points that I wanted to make was, oh, I said a farm boy with a stick. Matt kicking Galad and Gawain butts, even though he was still weakened from healing with a quarter staff. Yeah, and that's such a savory scene for most of us that can't stand uh, Gawain uh, and uh, those of us that especially at this point in the series, uh, already don't like Galad. I actually love Galad, but Gawain can go die in a ditch. I hate them both. Elaine's the only worthwhile child that came out of, <laughs> out, of, uh, out, of uh, out of Andor. I prefer Galad over Elaine. I don't care for Elaine either. I think that she makes some stupid decisions. Oh yeah, she does, but that, just, Galad's... Uh, yeah, yeah. I just I can't say too much about why I don't like Gala without spoiling Beyond the Dragon Reborn. 
but Gallup's basically, I think most people's problem with him is that he's, uh, he's lawful good. And a lot of people find those characters boring, but I appreciate that Galad sticks to his convictions. Like he, he's like, you know what, this is what I believe. And this is what I'm going to stick to. I'm always going to practice what I preach. I'm not going to, he, he's never a hypocrite. Yeah, and I, I will say that by uh, A Memory of Light, by the last book, I do like Galad then. But for the rest of the series, Galad can, you know, jump off a of freaking cliff for all I care. <laughs> but Gawain can always go die in a ditch and I would be happy. Yeah, that, that little bastard. But yeah, JD, you uh, you got your, your newts that you want to talk about? Yeah, um, this one's... Um... About the Amerlin assigning the girls this very dangerous task and perpetuating that teen savior trope. This is spy versus spy. As far as we've seen, nobody from the two rivers can keep their mouth shut for crap. Although I can understand why Swan decides to use Egwene and Nynaeve because they're the only people that she can be pretty much at least 98% sure that they're not dark friends. Yes, uh, but as we find out later in the series, there's another way to prove your trustworthiness in the White Tower. Good point. I guess maybe a little outside-the-box thinking probably could have saved these three from what could very well be death sentence. Um, Valid point. Also, uh, we didn't touch this in the synopsis, the, grain, the Gray Men and Lanfear in the Tower. Oh, yes. I'm surprised it wasn't on here. Right, this is our first exposure to corruption in Tower. Egwene and Nynaeve are attacked by a gray man, the first one we see in the series, um, while returning to, I believe it was the novices' quarters. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. They give chase, find him dead, and then uh, later on... Uh, yeah, because it starts with that that uh, bolt that streaks past yep. him and and you know hits the wall. Because they go back looking for it as as proof that something happened and it's gone as well. Yeah, and at the time that they uh, go to with, with the body, that's when Shirium comes by, I believe. Yes, and and uh... yeah, and she pulls the the typical Aes Sedai mystique of. Don't tell anyone what you saw. I'll take care of it. Get back to your yeah. quarters. This isn't a place for novices. Blah, blah, blah. And um, Matt is visited by Lanfear while he is still uh, laid up, recovering from being healed. And Egwene has a run in oh, with the daughter right. tonight. Uh, who uh, I believe was masquerading as that idiot farm. No, that idiot farm girl. Oh, um... Lanfear. Uh, I believe... It, it said in the encounter that Egwene felt something like she had not felt since she was a little girl, being completely overwhelmed by this woman. Literally one of the forsaken wandering around the halls of the White Tower. That is, if not foreshadowing, definitely something worth taking interest in. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, just... Think, think of the implications for that, for what you know um, uh, of the series leading up to The Dragon Reborn. We spend the entire uh, first book, The Eye of the World, being told that Tar Valen is this sanctuary, almost of sorts. It's a place where you can go and be safe and feel safe. And very quickly, you know, almost as soon as we're introduced to Tar Valen, we get to see it. It's very quickly, uh, that's bullshit. This place is just as dangerous as the rest of the world, if not more so. That crossbow bolt passes through where they would have been a split second later. So pure chance that one of them, that uh, that Egwene uh, and Nynaeve avoid being hit. Because they, they just went to go, they were going to go talk to Elaine and they see that she Elaine is not back in her room yet. Uh, so Nynaeve spots the man that shot at them and binds him in weaves of air and brings him to them. But by the time he gets to him, he's dead with a dagger in his chest and the crossbow is just gone. And then you had Sirium that walks around the corner. Uh, they tell uh, Elaine, I mean, Egwene and Nynaeve, tell um, Sirium what they saw and what happened. Uh, and it's Sirium that reveals that it's a gray man. Um, 
And that's when she remarks that there hasn't been a Grey Man in Tar Valen since the Trolloc Wars, at least that they know of. But then they go back, and they try to find the crossbow, but it's gone too. And Egwene is wondering why healing uses spirit, air, and water, um, which seems like a kind of just randomized thought. Um, that sounds like a naive thought. Yeah. Um, but even but more... Nynaeve uh, kind of goes, uh, fuck that, I'm going to do what I want anyways. <laughs> yeah. Um, but Nynaeve does make the note that Sirium never wondered who stabbed the Grey Man. And this is con- <sighs> this is considered the first of several examples of odd behavior from Sirium. Oh my god, I never even realized. That. We're uh, getting down. Matt and Tom are on the river. Well, no, hold on. Before they leave, Matt is attacked in the streets of Tarvalon. Yes, I thought that happened, but I could not remember. It's the Grayman effect. Because I, I didn't get that far. Um, so Matt is he's going bar to bar. Run, He's like running his luck for all it's worth. He's followed around by this um, sea folk dude. Who is just betting on Matt betting? <laughs> I love that. And uh, like they're both running it up. Seafoot guys calls it a night, and uh, Matt goes off, and he's like, "Well, I'm gonna go find a ship." Then he realizes he's being followed, so he ducks into it. This is where Matt's luck starts really oh, yeah. showing <clears throat> itself. So he ducks into an alley, realizes there's somebody on the other end of the alley. Ducks into, like, behind a trash can or something. The two meet, like, did he go your way? No, I thought he went your way. And they both go their separate ways. So from there, Matt decides it'll be safer to go on the rooftops. Because then at least he can see everything around him. So he hops up on the roof and finds what he thinks is another burglar. Or is a burglar, because Matt doesn't do anything bad at all, ever. According to him. (laughs) Um... (laughs) So they get into a bit of an altercation. Well, they get into a knife fight on the rooftops. Matt and whoever it was fall off the roof. Matt lands on the guy with the dagger in him. In the guy. So. Matt's luck. He's very lucky. Then he wanders. Like, like he wanders in just for a drink. First, first bar he sees. Lo and behold, Tom Marilyn. Like. 18 sheets to the wind. I like how they make Matt like stupid lucky. He's not just a little bit lucky. He's Um, stupid lucky. Yeah. He's that kind of person that like, you know, the rule and, uh, or the rule a lot of people use in Monopoly. If you roll three straight sets of doubles, then you automatically go to jail. Oh yeah. Like, yeah, (laughs) he's, he seems like the kind of person that rules like that would be made specifically for. Yes. He's literally domino. If anybody's seen X Men Two, yes, yes, being lucky's not a superpower. Yes, yes, it is. That's, that's Deadpool <laughs> oh, Two. Deadpool Two. Yeah. That. Spoiler: Domino is in Deadpool Two. <laughs> I saw that. With you guys. Being lucky's not a superpower. Yes, it is. She, she's she's a female Matt, straight oh, up. Head. That, that's Matt and Tuan's child. That is head cannon right now. I, oh, Matt, uh, spoiler! Sorry. Matt is reborn. <laughs> In a later life as Domino in the Marvel Universe. Confirmed. I'm into it. <laughs> that would explain why Domino has like the, the mark over the one eye. Yeah. Oh. It's uh, Matt's iPad. Snap. Guys, we're making links. Oh my god. <laughs> Conspiracy theory. The Wheel of Time series is actually a <laughs> historical record. But something we haven't mentioned that happens before uh, Matt finds Tom is Egwene takes a very, very important test. Oh. Oh, yeah. Elaine does, too. Accepted time. Yeah, Elaine does as well. Which nobody really cares but, about. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's, it's Elaine. Who really cares? <laughs> Elaine's kind of boring. Yeah. But we, we get to follow Egwene. Uh, much like we did with Nynaeve, whenever Nynaeve initially took the test to be raised to accept it upon her arriving at uh, the White Tower, basically, Egwene finally gets to take the test, and we get to follow her through it and um, see all... It, it's really, really revealing about these people's uh, character, because Egwene goes through the first arch, and in this alternate reality, she's married to Rand, and they have a baby girl, 
And she's like, I don't want this shit. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, strange things happen, and here Egwene suspects that Rand can channel. Um, she knows that she has healed people as Nynaeve's apprentice. Um, Rand experiences the worst headache that he's ever had, uh, and he's calling out for help, and Egwene just leaves. I mean, it's uh, these scenes, I mean, they're, they're heartbreaking, even though we, along with uh, the POV that we're reading through, know that it's not the reality they're in. But there's nothing saying that it's not a it's not a reality, um, because even the Aes Sedai don't know exactly why they see what they see and if it's really real or not. You also have to remember is that you're putting yourself in Egwene's shoes, and she does not know that this isn't real. Her memories are wiped to the point where she believes this is this is reality. Yeah, which is yeah, which is of course that, the nature that of true. that particular uh, Terra Angrel. Um, yeah, so too long didn't read. Egwene's greatest fear in any setting is Rand goes mad and dies because of her. Because it's uh, the very next chapter and everything is whenever um, Egwene makes it to Nynaeve's room and Elaine is already there crying on Nynaeve's lap and Egwene's just like, me too! And they all cry. And Nynaeve says that she'll make them pay and it's like, why? Why? Nynaeve is like that... Like, if, if Nynaeve was not, uh, I can't say this because it's kind of a spoiler, but it's kind of obvious. Nynaeve being yellow, of course she's yellow Aja. What else would she be? <laughs> but if she was not yellow Aja, she would totally be a green. But going back to the, talking about uh, Landfair being there, it was uh, Else Grinwell that she was disguised as. Yes. Yes, that's the name. Yeah. Because um, there's a part where, like, I think Matt uh, reaches out to, like, touch her arm or something. And she, like, just avoids his touch and very coldly is like, what are you doing out of bed? And then just leaves. Oh, yeah. And she would totally be into probably Matt. Like, like not Dagger Matt. Yeah. I, I don't know. Dagger Matt did some pretty serious damage. True, true. But I don't think he did anything to her specifically. Like, other than just look at her suspiciously, which he did to everybody. Yeah, but when you're that big of a creep about everything, people tend Valid to remember that. Valid point. <laughs> Matt, Tom, in the bar. Matt fin- Matt gives Tom Marilyn reason to continue on after what happened at during uh, the hunt, the uh, great hunt. Yeah. With his new love. <clears throat> More tragedy in the life of Tom Marilyn. But oh, poor Tom. Matt gets him at least aware enough of himself and his surroundings to get him up and going. Because that end was the woman of Tanchico. That's yep. the name of the end. Yes. Which is also the title of chapter 31. Yes. So they leave the woman of, woman of Tanchico. And Matt like has a freak out because he just killed a guy right there. And there is no body. Mm-hmm. From that moment, like Matt's like, I just get attacked by, you know, a padfoot or something, and the body was right here. Tom's like, there are no, you know, there are no pit pockets or padfoots in Tarvalin. Anything the White Tower would do to you is worse than anything the guards could come up with. So, you know, there aren't thieves in Tarvalin. Cheats, sure, but not thieves. Oh yeah, because it's. Because I think it's while while they're on yeah they're on the gray goal. Um, Matt hears a bump in the night the uh, the first night they get on and two men enter the cabin with knives and Matt kills them. Of course he's he's awoken Tom already. Then up on the deck he recognizes a voice as one of the men who was following him in Tar Valen and Matt kills him as well. Tom kills a fourth just as it go that guy goes to attack Matt and. Uh, the two remaining men jump overboard and swim for sure when they see Matt. And that's whenever they discover that there's a small boat tied to the stern uh, that brought them in to the ship. Um, and then Matt goes back to the cabin and collapses, you know, collapses and is like shaking. He's like, what the fuck am I doing? And then from there, they make it to uh, Andor where they are. They meet. Uh, I actually wrote this down because it's kind of important. Uh, Aldora. Who was the? Uh, oh, Aludra. Aludra, yes. Um, 
she was the uh, chairwoman for the Illuminator okay. chapter house in Karian. Yeah, the mistress of the Illuminator chapter, I think is what they were called. Yes. They meet her in a barn where she is attacked by um, several men. And it's either here or the next night where when they get attacked again, that Matt recognizes one of them <laughs> from his boots as one of the guys that attacked them on the uh, on the river. Aludra. Mm-hmm. She's important because she invented matches. Also lighters. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Matt rescues her. She thanks him by giving him a bundle of fireworks. Which Matt proceeds to be every redneck ever with. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love Matt. First night. Oh, God. First. She, she said, don't cut them open. I'm going to cut them open. First night. <laughs> first thing he does. Same, though. After the uh, taking stock of what he has, he cuts one open, realizes there's something that looks like dirt. in, in the powder. Yes. <clears throat> <laughs> and then does the most reckless thing ever and just dumps it in the fire because, oh, hey, it stirs. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, oh, all right. Matt. Tom, like, loses yeah. his shit. <laughs> uh, like, Tom quite literally shits a brick. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and, and Tom's just sitting there like, I could have stayed drunk in Tar Valid, but I had to come with this freaking lunatic. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so... Later on, they get attacked by, like, three guys and some high lady looking somebody. We're assuming they're all dark friends. Or they could just be jerks. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Um, Matt does probably the only smart thing out of his, his short experience with fireworks is he throws one in as a distraction. Toss it in the fire. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. Oh, Matt. So, um, um, Andrew, you know this. I was in the military, and my specialty was explosives. Mm-hmm. So, when I read him throwing gunpowder and fireworks straight into a fire, he was standing right next to. <laughs> my blood pressure just went through the top of my head. Matt's got a mat. <laughs> like. I just started, I just started like lunatic. doing our math about minimum safe distance and how he should have lost his leg and everything. Matt's luck. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but no, I have an entire rant about <sighs> this in the next uh, summary portion. But um, in Camelin, Matt has to uh, he tries smooth talking his way around the royal guards who we later find out are in the pocket of Lord Gabriel and failing that, failing Ugh. that he decides to repeat Rand's adventures, the adventures of the wall. Yes. Which this is not the last time that the wall comes into play. No, there's also a neat little call back here because he runs into the same guard ran, ran into. Is it? I I, I t- totally cannot pronounce his name. Talmanis? No, not Talmanis. Talmanis is not that no, guy. <laughs> it's Tal- Talonvor. Uh, Talvin- Talonvor. Yes. Talonvor. They're both T names. They have L's and A's, and it confuses me. <laughs> yes. I love Talonvor. I pronounced yeah. it differently that time. So. But we find out uh, Talonvor is still a good queen's man because he is straight laying into Lord Gabriel and all of his new hires. He's a very good Queen's man. <laughs> also, I cannot look at Lord Gabriel's name without thanking Gerald. <laughs> yes, it looks like that, doesn't it? I almost said that earlier whenever I was reading it. It looks like something you would name a gerbil. <laughs> Horrible animal puns. <laughs> Like I, I want to name my gerbil Gabriel, but you, you would have. Let's make it look funny. <laughs> yeah, you have to spell it that way. It, it looks like gerbil. It's a rule. <laughs> Gabriel, Gabriel the gerbil. Yeah. 
If I ever get like a gerbil or a, yeah, it, it would have to be we a were, gerbil. We were just saying that. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. It, yeah, it, it's it, it, it looks exactly like if you got a gerbil and you wanted to name it Gabriel, but you also wanted it to be a gerbil pun. <laughs> Like you amalgamate it into into the same name. Yes, exactly. Gerbil Gabriel. Yeah. We were talking about the um, the guards up at the front front gate are all Gabriel's men, and oh yeah, he's been systematically replacing uh, the queen's guard with men loyal to him. Except for Talonvor. Oh yeah, the great Talonvor. He, he he's a very good queen's man. Very good. Which there. this looks bad. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he'll do. He'll do anything for her. <laughs> but he won't do that. <laughs> he'll definitely. I'm a do good that. queen's man. <laughs> but you know, right now it looks like you know Lord uh, Lord Gabriel or Jabril or however you want to say it. Lord Gerbil. Um, Lord Gerbil. Yeah, I'm gonna go with that. Um, it looks really bad. Um. And not to spoil too much, later on, this actually turns out to be a very beneficial thing for the, the side of the light. Um, certain people benefit greatly from what happens, uh, from what Lord Gerbil has done. I think they all would have benefited greater if Lord Gerbil had stuck his we- Weasley nose somewhere else. Yeah, I agree. Oh, well, yeah. But he is who he is, and they tend to do the things they do. Yeah. Potato's going to potate. True. Potatoes and falafels everywhere. Yep. <laughs> gonna make me hungry. Can't do that. It's too late to eat. <laughs> I don't care. I'll still eat. I, I don't believe that there's a cutoff time for eating. If I'm hungry enough, I will deal with that heartburn all night. Unrepentantly. Oh, a valid <laughs> point. I don't get heartburn. Except for when I was pregnant and then it was just awful all the time. Even in the middle of the day. I want to talk about the um the girls' misadventures <laughs> on the river, right. where Nynaeve is like browbeating oh, yes, this yes. poor ship captain into going as fast as humanly possible. Oh, Nynaeve's seasickness! <laughs> hey, I'm super seasick, but go super fast. I just want it to be over. <laughs> <laughs> I feel that. Because they're on the uh, they're on the darter, right? That's the name of the ship. I think so. It takes them all the way to Tier. Uh, it does not take them all the way to Tier. Oh, that's right. Because they get off the ship, and then that's when they find those three oh, Aiel yeah. women, and Nynaeve heals yeah. one. Oh, so the the darter is the not daughter. Darter is the next ship that they get on. Yes, that's wait, right. is this whenever they they first meet Avienda? Yes. So let's... <gasps> yes, yes. Avienda. They meet uh, Bay. Um, you you want me to to flavor this? I'll be into this Bay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, do it. So, Nynaeve's got this poor ship captain going hell for shoe leather down the river, and all of a sudden they strike a sandbar, and it was like crack the ship. So instead of sitting around being patient to where they get pulled out and continue on their way, they decide we'll just hoof it. Literally. Yes. Because despite Carrion being in the midst of a civil war, that a certain Andorran sheep herder, who shall remain nameless, started <laughs> with help from a Gleeman, who shall also remain nameless, um, they're just going to walk the rest of the way to Tyr with their horses. Also a nameless o- Ogier helped them? I mean, he, he didn't really start the war. He gets dragged along. He, he just gets dragged them, along. <laughs> he, Poor Lord. He, he always gets caught up in shit, and he's always just like... Didn't he knock uh, over the, the stand in the chapter house? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was him. Yeah, yeah, that was Loyal. So so he was involved. Directly responsible for the Illuminators leaving Kyrian. <laughs> yes. But, um, so they um they decided to, to go overland, and they come across... And Aiel, who's just, you know, there's one or two of them just kind of standing there, which is very odd behavior from what anybody has ever been told about Aiel. I mean, let's face it. No one just comes across Aiel. Yeah, like, it's... the Aiel lets you find them. It's like Chuck Norris. <laughs> yeah, no, right? So they stop, 
and it is this it's our uh is our first encounter with avienda and the maidens of the spear i am not going to pronounce their name in the old tongue my tongue does not work that way far daris may or my far far derive far derives my yes somebody's gonna hate me (laughs) trust me with me talking on this podcast Anybody that listens is definitely used to things being pronounced. It, Pr- pronounced? See? Pronounced, pronounced incorrectly. <laughs> yeah, they're Actually, pronouncing. I, I think somebody in the group hates it whenever you uh, say pronunciation, that he prefers pronunciation, because that's oh, apparently yeah, proper. Yeah, I don't believe it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's because I normally, like, I get tongue-tied with it. I try to correct it, but it doesn't always work. If we all speak pro proper as English, we might as well still be British. May as well. So, fun fact about that is, uh, historically, actually... Southern accent is more traditional than the modern British accent. Yes, that was the original British accent before the one that we've all come to know and love and be jealous-ish of. Uh, I think... Anyway, as you were saying. I actually like German accents better. I'm a fan of, like, Limerick, but that's really regional. Um... I like Aussie accents, but... Um, So, Avienda is just hailing these three down for help. She then reveals to them that they've been watching watching the girls for a while. Oh my god! Oh, I'm sorry. I I just looked this up. Two of the other women are Bane and Chiad. Nice. I didn't even realize that. So, it's like pretty much all the important maidens in one place. Yeah, I, I was looking it up because I wanted to know who the other maidens were. I wanted to know their names. And yeah, Bane and Chiad are two of the other ones. I, I just like how at the point where she um she says that they've been watching them, just out of the rocks where you couldn't even hide a small dog, it's like, you know, four more maidens just appear. Oh, uh, Dylan is the fourth, uh, I yield that's with them. Some operator level camouflage right there. They just show up. The original special forces. And they operate operationally. <laughs> Do you even operate, bro? <laughs> Not as much as the Aiel, apparently. So they, they lead, lead them back to where one of, it was Dylan, I think it was, who was injured and on the verge of death. Yes, Dylan was the one who was injured. Yeah. Nanive works herself up into a lather uh, just to be angry enough to heal her. When you said that, I literally got the image of Nanive like rubbing her arms until like they started to bubble. (laughs) (laughs) Secrets revealed, Nanive is made of soap. (laughs) That's why she's so good at healing. Because she just murders <laughs> germs with soap. I love angry at Nynaeve, though. Just just every time that Nynaeve does something fantastic, she's just absolutely furious. And that's my favorite thing about her. Uh, honestly, like just the cognizant disconnect there. Like the words she, she was saying is like absolute just abuse to these poor women. But she's in the middle of act- healing, making everything better. <laughs> she she actually, uh, when they they question why she's using herbs to heal, she says the words, I use what I use, and that causes Chia to uh, compare Nynaeve to the wise ones. It's a fair comparison. Yeah, very fair. I'm, I'm into it. Nynaeve would make a great wise one if she wasn't so angry yeah. all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Nynaeve actually doesn't make a very good ice and die either because she's just angry all the time. That that's her perpetual state of being. Uh she heals Dylan and they um they go about their merry way, or so they think, where they are atta- when they are then attacked by a band of brigands and deserters who decide to sell them to some mysterious buyer. Goes through um, Egwene's point of view of getting knocked the hell out, and then coming to getting uh, naive to her senses and finding out that Elaine did not fare as well as the other two. So somehow they need to heal Elaine 
without disturbing the uh, people set to guard them and figure out a way out of there. Um, the mysterious buyers, of course, end up being uh, Mirdral. Three of them, which is a fantastic number to fuel your nightmares for Ooh. the next week. You want something else that'll uh, fuel your nightmares? Oh, God. I'm scared. <laughs> Merge all totally fuck. <laughs> We're not having this conversation again. <laughs> I, I just had to put it out there. I was there for the first one. We're not doing this again. <laughs> so this is the second instance of I the Aiel battle prowess because... The number of no more than 20 from what we're given, at least from what I read and uh, rereading it, took over this entire compound like they owned the place. And there were uh, six. They started out with like eight Aeol in this one room. And there were six holding off these Myrdal. The accepted trio finally burst out the door and just rain hell on, on them. Uh, Egwene uses fire. Elaine like compresses them with air. And this is the first instance, I think, of a female channeler using Balefire in the series. Of course, nobody knows it's Balefire at the moment. But Nynaeve just erases them and a beam of bright light and it was like they were never there in the first place straight up gone not even ash left uh surveying the damage we find out that uh dylan is one of the casualties of this rescue attempt which of course doesn't sit well with nynaeve at all they go their separate ways again and get on the uh daughter at the next town who, of course, passed the ship they were on, the first ship they were on, still stuck at the sandbar. Yeah, and um, Egwene, uh, when they were initially talking with the Maidens, they mentioned that they would never go against an Aes Sedai, even if they rained down lightning on them in Balefire. And Egwene recalls uh, thinking about Balefire during one of her trips through the uh, three uh, Terran Grial for the Accepted Test. So after Nynaeve unleashes it, Egwene is like, that must be Balefire. Nynaeve is very good at just, like, finding things by accident. Oh, yeah. So, you know, she's kind of just, like, Rand in that, except Rand has, you know, someone to help him, <laughs> basically. But, yeah, Nynaeve is, in terms of luck, when it comes to weaving and figuring out weaves that are lost or that she's never seen or whatever, she's got to be, you know, just as lucky as Matt is. Well, not quite, but still still close. Definitely close, because um, using Bellfire without knowing what you're doing is definitely a good way to die, or worse. She, she's very good at just figuring yeah. things out. It's, uh, yeah, it's after this that the, uh, the 19 surviving I.O. accompany uh, Gwen and Nynaeve and Elaine to Jereen. I.L. leave, and that's whenever they board the Darter. But um, the captain of the Darter uh, says that uh, he recalls seeing the Blue Crane, which was the ship that Nynaeve and Elaine and Egwene were on beforehand, still hung up um, on the on the sandbar. Yeah, I'd like to point out, like, not two days had passed, really. So they could have just stayed there and grabbed the, grabbed the Darter while it was uh, passing. Tear before the stone. Get to the point where... Uh, um, well, kind of before that, before we are, before anybody makes it to tier, uh, an update on Moraine, Land, Perrin, Loyal, and Fael, uh, they arrive in Ilion on the Snow Goose. Snow Goose. It's another ship. Everybody's on a ship except for poor Rand. <laughs> they stay... They intend to stay the night at easing the badger. That that actually becomes a kind of a joke later. <laughs> the, okay. I think it it has always been a joke. Well, th because... there's a part in this isn't really a spoiler because it's kind of obscure and it doesn't really it's not really important to the story, but 
there's a part where Perrin has to get a badger out of a bag and it says that he eases the badger. And I just cried with laughter when I read that. Yeah, that one's been building up for a very a long time. <laughs> but um, if y'all remember, easing the badger is the same in that Spell Dolman stayed in before he uh, set out for uh, Falm or before he got captured by Sanchon. Oh, yeah. My mind, my mind went straight dirty with the name Easing the Badger. Easing the I, Badger. I believe, it, I believe it's meant to. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, we've talked about that, like, uh, in the past podcast about, like, a lot of the names are, like, double entendres, like, what is it, the Nine Horse Hitch? Yeah. Okay, that's another one. I, I'm afraid to find out what that means. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, um, well, it, it says, I, I think it, it says it before, and it reiterates it in this book, that there's always been an end called easing the badger in Ilion, and it's never been in the most respectable of neighborhoods. Another fun fact is when Moraine finds out that Fael intends to follow them wherever they go, uh, in earlier printings of the book, it's written as Moraine gives Perrin a cold blue stare, but... As Moraine has dark eyes, it was later corrected to the phrase cold, dark stare. Oh, that reminds me. I made a mistake earlier. I posted it on Twitter and everything. Because on the audiobook for The Dragon Reborn, on chapter 10, it says, in the audiobook, it says the words, Nynaeve's dark blue eyes. But apparently, in the physical copies and the ebook, it just says dark eyes. So the audiobook is mistaken, and Nynaeve does not have blue eyes. I'm sorry. It happens. It's far from the worst mistake you can make. Trust me, I've made far worse. I'm pretty sure it's far from the worst mistake they made in the audiobooks. I read that oh, part yeah. four times just to be sure that I heard blue eyes and I was so excited and I thought I had discovered something and no, it's just a mistake on the audiobook. <laughs> it's really hard when you have an author that's, well, he's still alive when all this stuff's being done. He'll point out there's something wrong, but it wouldn't be corrected on the earlier parts because it was already done. It's yeah. like um, when you guys were talking with Kate Reading and uh, Michael Kramer. How, how he would uh, change the pronunciations midway through this uh, series. So, like, all the, all the first audiobooks, you know, before the change was made, all the early ones had it pronounced one way, and then the change was made and it's pronounced another way. I kind of noticed that if, if you just listened straight through with all the audiobooks, because I was doing them pretty much one month at a time because I was doing the Audible credit subscription yeah yeah and i noticed that somewhere in there some of the pronunciations changed mm -hmm. yeah i say we um let's let's make our way to tier now so um nanive egwene and elaine make their way finally get to tier finally nanive kind of leads them around until they finally settled on a house with herbs in the windows and nanive uh, pretty much points this out as the international sign of a wisdom or a wise woman. If there's herbs out in the window, it's somebody naive is, feels kinship to. Something else about this chapter, it's chapter 48, um, uh, appropriately titled Following the Craft, uh, as an allusion to Nynaeve looking for the, the, the herbs hanging in the window. Uh, we get to see uh, another example of Egwene's um, dreaming talent. She has several dreams that uh, have implications later on. Uh, she dreams of a white cloak putting Master Luan in the middle of a huge tooth trap for bait. Uh, Perrin with a falcon on his shoulder, which you already know what that points to. Perrin choosing between the axe he wore now and a blacksmith hammer, which is foreshadowing. Matt dicing with the dark one. Uh, and Matt shouting at her, I am coming. D-O-M-I-N-G. For anyone that might be confused. <laughs> Um, <laughs> she dreams of Rand sneaking through utter darkness towards Kalendor, while all around him, six men and five women were walking, some hunting him and some ignoring him, and some trying to guide him toward the Shining Crystal Sword, and some even trying to stop him from reaching it, pairing not to know 
where he was or only see him in flashes. Uh, and one of the men had eyes of flame, and he wanted Rand dead with a desperation she could very nearly taste. And she thought she knew the man as Baalzaman, which would be correct on description. She dreams of Rand in that dry, dusty chamber again with small creatures settling into his skin. Uh, Rand confronting a horde of Sean Chan and Rand confronting her and the woman with her. And one of them was a Sean Chan. So a good portion of the dreams have direct implications in the Dragon Reborn. But there's one, two, three, four. Yeah, there's at least four that have implications later on in the series i'm not going to tell you which ones and they get to the uh the wise woman's house and they spend like an hour trying the herbalist or healer and 90 spend an hour testing each other before it, it's finally settled that they can stay there yes i i'm totally into just wise women just like standing there telling each other what herbs are right and just to be sure i just want to make sure you're actually a wise woman <laughs> i i feel like it's more akin to every time i have a family reunion and all my aunts are um arguing over recipes oh that's true and there's like scoffing at each other <laughs> you you don't use that much black pepper <laughs> I was like, I didn't really pay attention to this part because it's literally Greek to me. In any event, uh, Adela struck and they can stay. I I'm sure Andrew's going to come up with the name here in a minute. Mother Gena? Yes, I, I have it right here in front of my face. Uh, and the price for them staying is just to buy some meat and other supplies occasionally. Yeah. She's a nice lady. Oh, yeah. <laughs> She's a nice lady. But, um... She from here, they hire Julian Sandar, who is a thief catcher, as opposed as opposed to Purin, who we met early on, who is a thief taker. Matt and Tom show up in the middle of a storm. Uh, the first thing that the first real building that Matt sees is, of course, the um, the house with all the herbs in front of it, which he thinks nothing of at the moment, and continues on to find some place to stay. They then spend the next uh, four or five days going to random inns, thinking that that's where they were going to be. Of course, um, during this whole time, Tom is getting increasingly sicker to the point where he stops uh, following Matt. That doesn't mean he, I mean, he still tries, but Matt's like, no, nah, stay here. Like, <laughs> you're about to die, old man. Like, just stay. Moraine, Lan, Perrin, Loyal, and Fael also arrive in Tyr, where they stay with one of Moraine's contacts. Yeah. I mean, this is a, like um, the the same chapter where Matt and Tom first arrive to Tyr uh, on the Swift. It's chapter 49, A Storm in Tyr. They, they enter the, um, a tavern called the Golden Cup, and Matt recognizes Komar, C-O-M-A-R, uh, and then demonstrates to... Well, Tom demonstrates to Matt, uh, and I think even the innkeeper there, that uh, Kamar is, is palming the dice. He's swapping them out using sleight of hand to have the best rolls. And that's whenever, because uh, Matt recognizes um, Kamar from his dealings with Lord G um, Jabril, or Jerbil, <laughs> as we're calling him. That's whenever Matt takes and grabs, uh, you know, he bets with Kamar, Kamar. Rolls a great hand. Matt grabs the same dice before he can swap them, swap them, um, swap them out. There we go. English. Uh, and then Matt rolls a rolls them, feeling his you know luck, hearing the dice roll in his hand, he gets a perfect hand. Uh, Kamar gets pissed and lunges at Matt, but Matt flips him, intending in, intending only to injure him uh, or put him down, but winds up uh, killing him. But not before Kamar's like, "There's other people hunting the girls." And then in a, a little bit of hilarity. The innkeeper uh, hustles him out and says, like, I'll, I'll just tell the defenders that it was a tall, redheaded man that I've seen in my dreams. Uh, <laughs> and nobody, like, Matt and Tom, like, they don't make the connection, but it's uh, proof that Rand is a, is appearing in or affecting other people's dreams, which is more foreshadow foreshadowing to what's about to happen. 
But uh, Matt also figures out his luck now that he realizes it only works on totally random things like dice and happening to walk to the right and to the right time. So Moraine, Lan, their group, uh, stay with one of Moraine's contacts. They start working out a plan on how they are going to get into the stone and hopefully intercept Rand. Uh, Moraine still wants to lead him on the right path. And we find out uh, in chapter 50 here, uh, the hammer that Lan mentions that he saw I.L. on the rooftops. And that's when Perrin recalls that the I.L. that he released in Remen, who we now know was Gaul, uh, said that yeah said that when the stone falls the il will leave the threefold land um i think this brings us up to our our overview pretty much on uh the the climax in the stone of tear climax in the stone of tear in tear nanive Egwene, and elaine are betrayed by julian sander a thief catcher who is under the influence of some form of compulsion by leandrin to the black aja and then imprisoned in the stone of tear where they are rescued by Matt and a repentant Julian, Fael falls into a Black Aja trap meant for Moraine, and Perrin risks his life in the world of dreams to rescue her. This is where Perrin promises to call Fael by her chosen name. Ran and the forsaken Bilal duel in the Stone of Tear. Moraine interrupts the battle and kills Bilal with Balefire. Balazamon appears, disables Moraine, and attacks Ran. Ran takes Kalandor, proving himself the Dragon Reborn. And with it, kills by Alzamon. Final fucking leap. Sorry. <laughs> Ran thinks he has killed the Dark One, who he believes was Balzamon. But Moraine tells him that the Dark One is not human, and therefore cannot have been Balzamon, because Balzamon left behind a corpse. Egwene, remembering parchment of prophecy that Varen said I showed her, instead deduces that the corpse is possibly a Shamael, chief among the Forsaken. The Aeol and Tyr take the stone and reveal themselves as the people of the dragon. In chapter 56, which is titled People of the Dragon, it's mostly from Matt's point of view. He's seen Ran. Ran's been roaming about the stone, holding Kalandor. Moraine says she... Uh, actually, uh, Matt asks uh, if all of this, everything that's happened, means that they are the people of the dragon. And Moraine says she does not know. But that's whenever like Ruach steps forward and shows the dragon on his left arm and uh, tells them that clan chiefs get that when they go to Ruiden. Barrelane uh, delivers a message. Um, and Moraine is like, why are you delivering messages? And, and Barrelane just looks confused, only recalling that whoever uh, gave her the message was impressive. Uh, Moraine reads it out loud. Uh, and it says, Luz Theron was mine. He is mine and he will be mine forever. Gave him into your charge to keep for me until I come, and it is signed Lanfear. Ugh, stage five, Clinger. Well, actually, Lanfear is more like a stage like ten, because e- even even after Luce there instead, she's like, yeah, y- your next reincarnation's mine too. She she's very possessive because she even calls the world of dreams her domain. Because mm-hmm. she made the comment, um, remember whenever Hopper takes Perrin in the wolf dream and they watch the meeting between the several of the forsaken which Lanfear's at and she comments that a uh, gray man and Murdral are denied dreams but this world is my domain and they're meeting in Teleron Riod or the world of dreams yeah she mentions it later too that that she's the most skilled using the world yeah. of dreams but she says she's the most skilled she does a lot of people would agree that uh, Mogadian Mogadian is more skilled than she is, but she would not make an open claim to anything because that's not yeah, her nature. Yeah, because she's a spider. Yeah, but it's it's kind of funny because so that uh, Egwene's dream about the six men and five women kind of following Rand, some not noticing him, some wanting to kill him, some wanting him to pull the sword, some not wanting him to pull the sword. It kind of culminates whenever Rand enters the heart of the stone and Bilal confronts him, basically tells him, like, only you can pull the sword, but once you do, I'm going to take it. It's mine. Yeah, because all the male forsaken Um, want Kalandor, and we find out later why they really want it. 
if you're keeping track, we're now down to nine Forsaken. The number goes down as well as it goes up. Yes, it, it, um, it, it kind of bounces around a little bit. After, because uh, Moraine obviously is the one that pops in and, and kills Bilal uh, with Balefire. You know, then it's, then it's Baal Zaman, as we know him, that, that shows up. He shows up and there's black lightning that throws Moraine across the room. He descends from the ceiling making a dramatic uh, entrance. He says that he's twice offered to let Rand serve him and twice uh, he has been wounded. And so now he's like, I'm going to take your soul. And Rand, you know, feels some kind of tearing at him, reaches out, grabs Kalindor, and Balzaman escapes through a twisting of reality. And Rand twists reality in the same way and follows him. Uh, is the first instance of a, a certain weave that is not yet named, I don't believe, in the series. But will be very soon. And it's a very important weave that has been lost to uh, everyone but the Forsaken for quite some time. Certain mode of being able to, to yeah. travel from place to place, if you would. I wonder what you would hmm. call that. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and you know he's 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 running uh, running chasing Balzaman. Balzaman tries to use Balefire on him, um, but Rand is able to use Kalendor to deflect the beam, which is interesting in and of itself. Because even at this point in the story, we know that nothing can stand up to ba to Balefire, but Rand can deflect it with Kalendor. That sounds like a great way to lose an arm. Yeah, or <laughs> yeah. a hand. So points on the climax. Um, after the betrayal of Julian Sandar, Matt realizes his luck is smarter than him, and um, goes back to the he goes back to the first building he saw when he came to Tear, only to find that the girls have already been taken to the stone, and are being imprisoned. He then uh, devises a plan to break them out. On the rooftops, that night he runs into Julian Sandar and a good number of the Aiel that are already in tier. Yo, what's up? <laughs> I, I want to talk about this because this is probably the probably the scariest thing that has ever happened to a defender of the stone in several hundred years. Matt takes all of the fireworks that he was given. Terrifying. Wraps them together in a tight little bundle and stuffs them through an arrow slit. <laughs> Have I mentioned that I love Matt? <laughs> so, an arrow slit is, um, historically speaking, generally no more than like six inches across. It winds out on the inside so you can still uh, shoot angles behind it with while having maximum protection. Now, what I, uh, I figured he was originally given like a 10, 10 to 15 pound pack of fireworks so he's probably down to like nine or ten lots of fireworks yes which is are now all compressed in this pack and compressed even further by being stuffed into this arrow slit the light blinded idiot then ignites <laughs> i love that <laughs> out of all the things that the defenders of the stone might have expected i don't <laughs> think an explosive breach was one of them. <laughs> they did not have that technology yet. Um, Aludra's first weapon. Yes. Which, I mean, thinking of, I mean, not trusting Aes Sedai, thinking some male Chandler's going to attack the stone. You might expect fireballs, but just the concussive force from that had to have scrambled at least five people's insides. If anybody was in a hundred feet of that within the stone, they are dead. Yeah. Although Matt's pretty lucky. He probably only knocked a couple people out. <laughs> hey, never underestimate Matt's redneck side. All right. He did come from the country. Well, that's just my knowledge of explosives and, you know, breaching. That's why uh, we don't use any more than like five pounds, no matter what we're trying to get through. Because... Uh, Matt just blew an entire section of the wall you, out. You gotta remember, For though, Matt knows none of this. If Eludra was there, Eludra probably would have been like, maybe we use a little bit less. <laughs> yes. He would have done like Tom whenever he threw the fireworks in the fire. She would have shit bricks, too. 
<laughs> she would have been so mad. I'm pretty sure Matt and everybody who heard that explosion shit bricks. Because <laughs> I think it even says that, like, even Matt didn't expect it to be like that. Like, no. He's like, let's just see what happens. <laughs> it's the equivalent of him releasing a badger on the green. Except he the badger will happens. eventually just, like, run away and probably wouldn't actually cause that much damage. Because initially he just wants to create a diversion. He wants to blow a big ass hole in the side of a in the side of this unbreachable fortress. Whoops! When you accidentally breach the fortress. Yeah, but it, it also says like um, he jumps in, and it still takes five or ten minutes before uh, Sandar joins him. And even even then, it took several minutes before any defenders got to Didn't- him. Matt also see Rand scaling the wall and just didn't recognize him. He saw somebody scaling the wall. Somebody yeah. with red hair and not dressed in yeah. cotton. And that was Rand. That was Rand. I mean, all, all he could see, I think, was a uh, was a dark figure. And he figured, I think he figured that it must have been one of the IL because he could tell they were kind of tall. Well, halfway. So right. like, it's got to be one of the IL that I've seen. But I do want to, I do want to credit the IL here. That is definitely not the way they would have done it. But they they flew they um they flow through that pretty. They're just like whatever this works. Pretty crudely. <laughs> yeah, because uh you know and Gaul is there as well. I love Gaul. And it's right before uh he blows this hole in the wall that we actually meet Ruark. Yes. And Ruark uh, introduces himself to Matt. I I just think how scary this entire thing had to have been for the defenders, <laughs> because at this point they are regaled to ceremonial use only. Well, because this yeah. stone isn't supposed to be able to be broken into, you should be able to protect it with pretty much five guys. It's probably like supposed to be the easiest thing to protect. <laughs> but then some dumbass blows a hole in the wall, and next thing you know, you're surrounded by e- Aiel, and then there's a guy channeling, and you're just like, don't know what's happening. I, I do have to credit them. They did not. They didn't quit. No, they didn't. I mean, look at Matt. Like, so he gets in there, and towards the end of chapter fifty-four, uh, where they first make go into the stone. So, of course, the chapter's titled "Into the Stone." Matt fights the High Lord uh, Darlin uh, and knocks him out, even though he's an excellent fighter. And he sits there, and he's like, he sees Rand walking across the corridor, but he's like, I must be seeing things, and almost as an afterthought knocks out another high lord who is about to stab him from behind and then just continues to hunt for the dungeons like matt <laughs> it's like that's a straight baller move he's just like bop he, this guy's knocked out too all right let's go find the matt's dungeon like stupid luck matt just matt's a honey badger all right matt is a honey badger <laughs> he just don't I give love a damn matt. although there's not many characters that i hate in the book rand's fighting below uh and Moraine shows up out of nowhere and zaps him with a bar of bellfire. Meanwhile, um Down in the dungeons. Down in the dungeon. Uh uh Gwen, Nynaeve, and Elaine, they're all shielded. Uh Gwen is able to enter the world of dreams and shields Amako uh and then steps out of the dream and wakes back up in the cell at where Elaine and Nynaeve are like, We heard a scream. Uh, and she, they realize it feels different now, but they're still shielded. And Egwene's like, I'll try again. And Nynaeve's like, I'll sing you to sleep. <laughs> so there's this battle raging on. There's a hole blown in the stone of tear, and Nynaeve is singing Egwene to sleep. I love Nynaeve. Uh, and then Matt walks into the dungeon with Julian, sees Amiko, and then Julian's like, that's one of the Aes Sedai who took the girls. <laughs> I love that. I hope that they make that his actual accent. <laughs> uh, I really hope so. Um, but then, like, Matt Matt walks up to her, and she seems awake, but she just looks at him and asks for help. And then Matt just takes the key and unlocks the cell. Uh, <laughs> and Nynaeve and Elaine are there kneeling by Egwene, and they, they, they react to him with, like, serious disapproval. That's the one time these girls really piss me off. Like, what are you doing here? Oh yeah, he just saved your asses, and you guys are thoroughly ungrateful. Matt's just like, I'm sorry. Would you rather just stay in the dungeon? Yeah, yeah. But that's like he actually says something to that. I I could just leave you here if you want. You, you don't have to. They just ignore him and walk out. Yeah. After Nynaeve like 
pulls a Hermione and knocks out Amako. Well, I guess Hermione pulled a nine Eve because yeah. that's after, but um, just punches Amako and knocks her out. And I'm like, <laughs> it's fair enough. I mean, then uh, Perrin is still in the Wolf Dream with Hopper trying to search for Fiel. They found her at least once already. Uh, and she disappeared. And that happens at least twice more. Yes, and and that part makes me so sad because Loyal's like, not by you. <laughs> so then, uh, parent smashes a brass door with a hammer, uh, and inside there's a flock of falcons that attack him and and are cutting him with their talons. He finds a perch with a falcon chain to it, and the lock is shaped like a like the hedgehog, the one that Fiel picked up which was the trap and Perrin breaks the chain and then blacks the fuck out and wakes up uh, in the dining room of the star and Fael is tending his wounds. The hedgehog is broken and they whisper sweet nothings to each other. Oh, my hero. I ship it. <laughs> I ship you it. broke the hedgehog. I owe you everything. <laughs> Um, and so after the sweet nothings, it switches back to Rand doing battle with Balsamon through uh, what they call the strange version of the Heart of the Stone, which we know is the World of Dreams, because that's where all Forsaken seem to run to when they're fighting Ran, is the World of Dreams. I guess it makes, um, it, if you can control your surroundings more, it makes it a little yeah. bit, it, it gives you a benefit, especially at this point, since Ran doesn't know what he's doing with anything. Mm-hmm. So it it's it's just convenient for them. It's also very considerate, because unlike some people, they have no interest in destroying everything around them. <laughs> <laughs> that. So they're they're fighting uh, in the World of Dreams version of the Heart of the Stone, and Rand sees some familiar black wires running from Baalzaman into the shadows around him. Um, that's a hallmark back to the the end of the Eye of the World, where Rand fought. Um, was it Al? Is it Algamar? Yes. Agnor. Where he fights the two I, Forsaken around the, the pool of pure Sidene. I think Agnor is one of them. Is it? Yes. Yes. Because it's very confusing because there's also a Forsaken who's later called Ar- Arangar. That's what I was thinking of. Alright, yeah, you're right. But so it is Agnor. Agnor is a Forsaken that ran I was, yeah. earlier. That's why I'm always cautious because I keep wanting to think that that is Arangar. But yeah, you're right. But um, so Rand... He says it worked once before. He <laughs> takes Kalendor and cuts the black wires after Balzaman calls on the Dark One to aid him. And of course, the shadow swells. And then so he severs the black wires. Uh, Balzaman seems to somehow shrink, but yet grow larger at the same time as if there were two of him. And then Rand stabs Balzaman through the chest with Kalendor and the shadow vanishes. Suddenly, they're both back in the real world. And Balzaman's body has a hole burned through the chest. And... Of course, the burn pits where his mouth and eyes were. And Rand, uh, in typical Rand jumping to conclusion fashion, believes he has killed the Dark One and won Tarmageddon already. Yay! So, and then that's whenever he brings down, like, Kalendor uh, and commands the fighting to stop. For, for those uh, of us who know that there's 12 more books, we know that's not the end of it. <laughs> what? You, you mean the, the rest of the books aren't just, like, you know, him being the ruler of the world, like Otter Hawkwing. I'm, I'm totally. really glad that never actually happens. <laughs> I, I, imagine <laughs> Rand with that kind of power. That would be a boring oh, no, like, It would just be a disaster. Books. Like, it would yeah. be painful to read. This, this Rand with that kind of power. It would be painful to read. Oh, true. Rand's still kind of a baby here. But this is at the end of chapter 55. Of, is whenever Rand does claim the title of Dragon Reborn, and everyone kneels to him. Yay! And then we get into the last chapter, 56, People of the Dragon, um, that starts with that, you know, kind of omniscient narrator point of view, where it says, you know, we're in the morning, people uh, of Tyr awoke from dreams where the Dragon Reborn fought Balsamon in the heart of the stone. The Dragon Banner is now flying above the stone of Tyr, and people are in the streets shouting, you know, Randall Thor, the dragon, all hail Randall Thor, the dragon reborn, all hail the dragon. So, yeah, the one of the cities that is uh, the most abhorrent against channeling is now hailing someone 
Yeah. Who can more than just channel. They were against channelers, and now they are ruled by a male channeler. Because, yeah, there's even a point where Matt's... Matt is like, oh, there's nothing to do now but clean up since, you know, Rand has already killed Shaitan. And Moraine is like, you're a fool if you think the Dark One would leave a human body. Oh, Egwene uh, mentioned a parchment of property, this that uh, Varen showed her. That yeah. is probably Ishama, Ishamayo. Ishamayo, yeah. Then Moraine's like, there are still nine forsaken on the loose, and three of the seals are broken. Uh, so we're far from done, because you got to set up the ominous feeling for the rest of, for the next book at least. And then uh, that, like I was saying earlier, then that's whenever uh, Bear Lane, the first of Mayin, enters and delivers a message, the the message to Moraine. And of course, coincidentally, can't remember exactly who gave it to her, but only that she was very impressive. And Moraine reminds Matt that he's a Taveran as well as the sound of the Horn of Valir, so nothing is done for him yet. And all the other girl, the girls stare at him with some like mixed emotion, and Ruark like respects him. Um, Unpopular opinion, I like Baraline. Uh And then, of course, in typical Matt fashion, he says it can count on him, but in reality, he's planning to leave as soon as Tom is fit to travel. And ready to be outy. In typical Matt fashion, he's like, I've done what I came to do. I'm about to peace out. Uh, <laughs> and we'll see how that works out for him uh, in the next book. So, yeah, uh, any final thoughts on The Dragon Reborn? As Not, not Rand, uh, but the book, of I course. <laughs> Uh, I think we hit all the points that I wanted to make. Uh, I know, JD, I know you wanted to talk more on the IL tactic. I, I, I love um, the comparison of these two points. JD's is, he wants to talk about explosions, explosions, and IL tactics, and mine's like, dreams, dreams, and then the one time Matt fought Gawain and Galad. <laughs> yeah, and then I'm, <laughs> then my, I'm like the pleb like, with like nothing on mine, it's just blank. Well, I mean, you uh, you kind of stick with what you know, and that's what I know. I uh, yeah, that's perfectly fair. I mean, I, that's why mine are blank because I don't know shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yours yours can be summed up with explosion, it's explosions, war tactics. Which after <laughs> eight, eight years, I I would hope that I know a fair deal about that. Um, but yeah, the Aiel, um, two Aiel versus like ten of these hunter of the horns two two hunters and their goons like they're uh that the way uh the maidens had like their outer security even while they were asking for help like that that was a desperate spot and they had no like no idea what they were going to get but the fact that they managed to keep their cool or um the way they i, I talked about how they raided the compound like they walked waltzed in like they owned the place yeah, and like uh, hopefully nobody minimizes exactly what that means because uh, JD and myself being uh, either prior military or current military, having military experience, we can appreciate that um, based off of our training. You know, the the whole no matter what's going on, maintain security, keep the area safe because if the area is not safe, it doesn't matter what else you try to do, you're in danger and you're probably going to die anyway. Yeah, and uh, having to deal with the overwhelming or outnumbering force yeah so i mean that, that's that's not lost uh i know when uh some of you that are like battle tactic enthusiasts or have military experience as well or even if you just play like airsoft and paintball um can probably appreciate just the how impressive or how good uh some uh tactic of that of that magnitude i guess is i do none of those things yeah, it's fine. I mean, you can like, <laughs> you can still appreciate it from like an understanding what it means and what it does. Point at the very least. Yeah, I, I'm like the casual voice here. I don't know anything about that, but I can appreciate. I it. mean, to put it in perspective, <laughs> think about it this way: think that you're in a building where you're some guy has just opened fire and you're injured, and the police and EMTs rush in and they don't know where the guy is, but they want to treat you. So one of the cops stays there to make sure you're safe with an EMT as he treats you, and the other cop continues, you know, watching for a threat. You, you, that's like beyond totally reasonable. Yeah, beyond being focused on how much pain you're in because you got shot or whatever, you know, you're gonna appreciate the fact that 
they're standing there making sure that you're safe while also trying to, you know, save your life. And that should be fairly similar to the feeling that I imagine uh, Nynaeve, Elaine, and Egwene would have had whenever Avienda and the rest of the uh, Maidens of the Spear showed up to save them. I feel like that's the uh, logical thing to do, too. Like, just because you're safe for now, if you just recently had somebody who got injured, you have to be protective, too, because... They're vulnerable. It can happen again. They're vulnerable, and if you're not watching, you're vulnerable because you're trying to pay attention to them. Yeah, um, well, the problem with that, yeah, and yeah. I know this is going to get cut, so it doesn't matter. Uh, you get the rubber knit necking effect when somebody gets hurt, where you know you should be doing oh, that, yeah. but also your buddy just yeah. got hurt, and you're like, you want to turn around, you want to check on him, but like somebody's already doing it. Yeah, or sometimes even like people who aren't involved want to get like distracted like whenever you're driving down the road and there's been a car wreck and these people are driving super freaking slow because they want to see the wreck i'm like why do you want to see that i'm like just go everybody wants to see the show when part of your job is making sure there aren't any more people getting hurt it comes it becomes that much more important also oh it's also them taking uh in their stride yes matt just blowing a hole in the side of this massive structure <laughs> and that's wall hole <laughs> wall's very good at breaching stones you know comparing them to the defenders of the stone it's like you know the defenders are the boy scouts and the IEL are just like seal team six <laughs> yeah yeah even i know what that is <laughs> oh that's so that's so mean, but so accurate. Oh, God. I'd hope so. They had their own movie. I don't watch movies. <laughs> the freak, the defenders are, like, sitting there, like, <laughs> in the training room. Oh, they were going to learn how to tie knots and build a fire. And the IL are like, we're doing live fire exercises. Fight now. Train how you fight. If it ain't raining, <laughs> we ain't training. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? This, this guy we don't know just kind of blew a hole in your wall, and I'm just going to use it. All right. Well... Um, I think we have definitively covered the Dragon Reborn book. Woo! Yeah. Thorne, do you want to remind the, the lovely people that are listening who you are on Twitter? I am Thorne Corda I I go by Thorne Fireheart, or at Thorne Fireheart. I am a Wheel of Time enthusiast and an artist, and that's pretty much all I do. And JD, do you want to do the same? Uh, I'm JD. You can find me on most social media as JD the Wanderer. Uh, I'm a Wheel of Time enthusiast, um, along with love of all things tactical and tactical. Um, <laughs> I, I do not have a Twitter. As we found out. <laughs> yes. Uh, I don't have a Twitter, but I'll probably, probably get one of those here soon. You should. Yeah, come on. Join the Twitter of time community. <laughs> I, I did not have any uh, Wheel of Time friends. I had one Wheel of Time friend bet- before I joined the Twitter of Time community, and that was a total accident. I only joined Twitter for uh, Rafe Judkins' Wheel of Time Wednesdays, and the next thing I know, I have all these people who are also fans of the Wheel of Time, and I'm like, I know so many people now. Uh, it was pretty much the same for me. Like I had it from back whenever I uh, used to attempt to stream on Twitch. And then um, I saw the news that the TV show was coming out, uh, you know, around October of last year or September. And then I just started looking around on Twitter again. And what actually introduced me was I found the White Tower podcast. And I was like, oh, cool. And then I was just like, holy shit, there's a big community out here. I I think the first person that I actually, like, noticed a lot was uh, Malkir's King. Mm -hmm. Because he is everywhere. Um, actually, I got I got into the community through uh, Daniel Green. Oh, nice! Woo. Yeah, fantastic content creator. Gotta gotta love the guy. You can't not love Daniel. I think I was um I was just looking on YouTube because I had uh I just finished the series. I'm like, you know, is there uh is there anything else going on with them or something like that? And it came on a Wheel of Time coming to coming to TV. Yeah, he he's very up to date on all of his information most of the time too. Oh, yeah. He's fantastic, and I feel honored to have been able to talk to him on the podcast and uh, and everything. But 
Um, to try to keep this from being too much longer, um, I will cut it down <laughs> as much as I reasonably can. Uh, well, you yeah. definitely got a couple of spoilers. You got. Uh, yeah, out. yeah, I got a couple sections to cut out, and it's it's going to be fun trying to trying to get it done. But um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that tangent on pregnancy has to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll see. I'll, I'll cut it out and save it as like a blooper to go on like Patreon or something. Uh, my conversation about pre yeah. <laughs> But um, for all of you lovely people that are listening, of course, you already know who we are. This is the Black Tower podcast. And of course, we've had Thorne and JD on as prospective potential co-hosts on the, the Black Tower podcast. There are four more potential co-host coming up in the next two episodes we have so episode 22 and episode 23 so stay tuned for them and be thinking after you've heard all six of our i guess candidates um there'll be again some voting on twitter and discord for who you enjoy the most who you thought would be who you think might be the best fit yeah so uh if you want to find any of our stuff for the black tower podcast you can go to blacktowerpod.podbean.com on the left-hand side, there's a link to literally everything. There's a link to the Twitter, to the Discord, to the YouTube, to the Facebook, to the Patreon. Uh, and then if you click on the contact or contact us tab, it has our email. You are more than welcome to contact us there. Appreciate you listening. I know this is going to be a bit of a longer episode, uh, even whenever I edit it down. But we, I do thank you for, for your patience and listening. And if we missed anything or got anything wrong or didn't cover something you think we should have, uh, by all means, feel free to tweet at us or email us or, or whatever have you. So for those of us here at the Black Tower Podcast, I am Andrew. I am Thor. I'm JD. And we will see you guys next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.